For me, please, to uh, oh, let's go to Psalm 16. The title of the message, I think I've used this before, and I'm so I'm so into this that I don't care what the title of the message if I've used it before. I don't. It's just um, I'm thankful that uh, I'm thankful for the faithfulness of God. Father, we thank you for the giving in these uh, plates. We thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for the faith to come forward and to trust you in a manner that is very dear to us, whether we want to admit it or not. It's the money earned, <laughs> and Lord, that we can give, we can trust you with all our hearts, with all our minds, our souls, our strengths, and all of our pennies, oh, sorry, our nickels, our dimes, our quarters, our dollars, our hundreds of everything, Lord, everything. We recognize it comes from you. We give back to you according to your word and with a cheerful heart. And everybody who gave says, amen. Thank you. No, that's good. That's good. I just don't want to leave that there today. And just and bear with us. I'm not going to say we're going to stop doing it. We have implemented. I can't, I can't say for sure it's going to be every Sunday. My aim is every Sunday. I think if the Lord tells us not to do communion one Sunday, we won't. So if you come here on a Sunday morning and see there's no communion, you've got to love me. Uh, but my, my, uh, my heart tells me, and I'm just being transparent, I'm wondering that... Uh, um, you should be seeing the communion table every Sunday. For how long? I don't know. And why, Rick? Why? Here's, here's my primary focus. Because you need it. 
because I need it. And I think of all the communions we've had over our 30-odd years, 32 years of existence that um, were being amped up. Spirit, soul, and body. So Psalm 16. I want to talk about the presence. The presence of God. You know, we, this all started with me with that, I was going to say silly message titled Dance so long ago. And I started to see things that kind of caught me off guard and, and I've shared this with you and I need to say it again to just take a run at this is um, I, I saw what I wasn't expecting to see, what I didn't think I was going to see was that uh, David was changed by the presence of God. Dancing is just minuscule. David saw the reverence. David saw the seriousness, how God just so desired his presence with his people. He saw, he saw the ill effects when it wasn't treated properly. He took the blame himself. And I believe that's one of the reasons, put my first scripture up there for me, uh, James from Psalm, no, the first scripture, is not my first scripture, uh, Psalm 51? On my, Okay is created me a clean heart, O oh God. This was his prayer after he had fallen greatly, one of his greatest falls, when he, uh, when he had the adulterous affair with Bathsheba and tried to cover up by ultimately having her husband killed. And he said, when he was found out, we know this prayer in Psalm 51, he says, Lord, created me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David knew the value of God's presence. And that's where Ricky's at right now. This is what Ricky's speaking about right now. The value of the presence of God. Not just the value of our receiving it and being, honoring the value of worshiping and, and being in the fear of God. And as I say that, it, it, yeah, just the, he is a consuming fire. The old adage is if we had the Queen of England here, we would just be sitting up a little straighter, maybe a closer to the front. Try to get a view of her. That's why I'm aging myself using the Queen of England, aren't I? I think I need to tell you quickly the Audrey, Rake, uh, Audrey Richardson story when the Queen Mother, I think it was, it, not the Queen Mother, came to Niagara on the Lake in 1981. And she was going to be at St. Mark's Church. And the week before, somebody said to Audrey Richardson, this is my version of the story, but said, you must be very, it was, a, it was a visitor or whatever, you must be very excited, the Queen Mother's going to be with you next week. And she goes, oh, we're excited every day, the King of Kings is here every Sunday. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> he is. He is. <clears throat> is a school of learning, of practicing that presence, of reverencing, of honoring, welcoming, living in the presence of God. And I want to talk about some of the benefits of living in the presence of God. You know, David said in Psalm 139, he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? That tells me that David, he, he wanted at times to flee God's presence. And so do you. Don't tell me any differently. Maybe not flee, but you don't always welcome God's presence. He's everywhere. Think about that. Everywhere do you always welcome the presence of God? Do you sometimes wish, whoa, it's too bad God saw that. <laughs> or maybe even, even before a transgression or, or, or before a decision we make or a place we go or, or a thought we think, we just you know, well, we'll just lean on mercy. I know God sees this, but I'm going to use, just narrow my theology a bit. I think David battled with that. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, behold, big word, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, listen to this now, your hand will lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. That's the mercy.
mercy and grace of God. So there's no better person we can learn about the presence of God than from the writings of King David himself, the man who was called a man after God's own heart. He was after the presence of God. And we've been praying all of last year, and we're praying all of our scriptures, annual scriptures, for the year. Is uh, from Psalm 16, a psalm of David. We prayed that, uh, show me the path of life. For in your presence, what's, so, you will show me the path of life. For in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In God's presence, there is fullness of joy. I believe that David feared losing God's presence over anything or anyone. That's what caused him to write the 51st Psalm where he says, cast, not, cast me not away from your presence or do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. He feared losing God's presence over anything or anyone. I want to be a man after God's own heart. I'm talking about the presence of God. Yes, the Holy Spirit of God. God himself. You know, you start mentioning the Holy Spirit and it conjures up thoughts of charismatic chaos, loss of control, unbalanced, embarrassing actions and people. Can I get a testimony? Can I get a witness? Yeah, God does take over our lives. God does change. Things become strangely dim. I'm just realizing this morning how much that song fits. I've been challenged as a father because as I've said, if I haven't said this publicly, I don't know if I have, I've careful how I say it, but when Alexander went to Africa, I liked him when he left. When he came back from Africa, I really liked him. And the reason I say that is because I saw and I have seen God take control. And for that to have happened, I've asked, Lord, what did happen? What changed? Alexander, this world he was in, this world he was raised in for the first 19 years of his life, became strangely dim. And he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit of God, with the Word of God. We don't have to go to Africa for that to happen. We as a church are benefiting from it. I as a father and we as a mother and a brother, a family, we're thankful for it. This isn't all about Alexander. Now last week he gets up here and he lists, speaks a message that, uh, that ministered to me. And he, but most importantly, I tell you, Alexander spoke on words. He said it was going to be a hard message. You aren't going to leave here very cheerful kind of deal. And I can tell you that I, I received that message with a greater depth having watched Alexander live it for at least the past six months of his life. As a matter of fact, even this week, I heard him practice it in that he's been spending a lot of time at the church and we have some septic problems here. Don't anybody get right out on me. Ladies, bear with us. When this is all finished, you're going to have the most loveliest washroom at Life of Wonder Fellowship. That's the truth. It is. It is. You are. But you only have one stall working right now, so there's one over here in the nursery room. When it says out of order, don't go in there. And, but anyway, Alexander, our septic, we just got some challenges going, and Alexander had some plumbers here, and we had some people, and I was on the phone with him, and he was explaining some things to me, and I could tell he was a tad bit frustrated. Well, Dad is doing this, we got this out in the field, we got electrical problems, we got, and he was also watching his niece, Nevea for the whole day. So Nevea was with him. So as he's on the phone, well, Dad, you know, and I could hear, he's just a tad bit agitated, or, you know, we're just, was, we're on the edge. Okay, well, I'm trying to give him the answer. Yeah, okay, well, let's do this. He goes, he goes, oh, baby. I said, what? Oh, baby, just stand still. Baby, don't move. Don't move. He was in the hallway. Nevea would, went to the bathroom to go to the bathroom, apparently, as I understand it. But Nevea, let's just say she had an accident. And I found out afterwards it was everywhere. Oh, baby, baby, no, don't move. No, I'll call just do not. Dad, I have to go. <laughs> baby, don't, baby, don't touch that. Baby, don't touch it. Bye, Dad. And I can tell you, 
that if you kept that coolness and that calmness after you got off the phone with your niece, you do practice what you preach and you'll be a good father. But get ready, you, you, you never fully arrive. But that's just some of the things, and I don't mean to exalt any one individual here, that's just some of the things that become strangely dim in our lives when we're exposed to and make that decision to live in the presence of God. We, A, become worshipers. Not just on Sunday mornings, always. We just live as worshipers. Because he told the woman at the well, Jesus did. He said, I seek for those. I look for those who will worship me in spirit and in truth. Ones who come into contact with the presence of God. And oh, she did. Oh, she did. We have this treasure, Linda, in earthen vessels in these jars of clay. Do you not know? Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, Lyle? Pat? Richard? Kevin? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Whoa, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. Wherever I go, whatever I do, whatever, you're there. Your right hand leads me. Your hand leads me. Your right hand holds me. Oh, we should get up here and sing how great is our God again. Amen? I've just done some, some delving. I've looked at a few things that we can see. What are the benefits? What can we expect? What can we look for? We need, in order for faith to be activated, I'm not saying this is all about us. I've told you. The most important reality of the presence of God is we're worshipers of him. But what, for faith to be activated, what can we expect? What can we look for? Being those who practice the presence of God. In saying that, I wanted to make this a God in your iPod kind of message. So I'm going to play a song for you. And this is by Eric Clapton and Steve Winwood. Eric Clapton wrote this song. I want to do this. I, I, I argued whether I should play this or not because this obviously won't be everybody's genre of music. Eric Clapton is considered one of the best guitarists in the world ever. I could play some of his songs here and everybody would recognize some of them. He was raised an Anglican, in an Anglican church, exposure to an Anglican church in England. Found out he was a uh, a protege or, or just an a incredible musician and guitarist and got involved with, as he says it, how's it go? Drugs, sex, and rock and roll. I don't know if I got those in the proper order. I think his was rock and roll, sex, and drugs. And he had an encounter with God. I don't know when it was. My next chapter Starbucks book, I think, is going to be Clapton's book. I never read it. It came out a few years ago. But I did read some excerpts, and I did look at it, and he, he said... Here's is the song he wrote. He goes, I have finally found a way to live just like I never could before. I know that I don't have much to give, but I can open any door. Everybody knows the secret. Everybody knows the score. I have finally found the way to live in the color of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. This song is called The Presence of the Lord. And I'll only, I'm only going to play three minutes of it. It's six minutes. I highly recommend if you enjoy it, go home and YouTube Eric Clapton, Steve Winwood, Presence of the Lord. They performed this, uh, I think, in 2007. Steve Winwood himself is, uh, is a uh, virtuoso on the Hammond organ. And uh, I, I could tell you some of his history, I won't. But Steve Hammond also, Rebecca and Grant, you might know this. I don't know what CD it is. The CD that Ashley did of the hymn. Steve Winwood does a duet with Ashley Cleveland, uh, um, I Need Thee Every Hour. Ashley saw Steve Winwood. They were going to the same church together. And she went and warmed up to him and said, you want to sing on my album? And... Grant will play that at the end of the service today if we have it. But he said this about the song. He goes, I was in complete despair, said, Ka said Kaplan, uh, Clapton. In the privacy of my own room, I begged for help. I had no notion who I thought I was talking to. I just knew that I had come to the end of my tether. And getting down on my knees, I surrendered. Within a few days, I realized that I had found a place to turn to, a place I'd always known was there, but never really wanted or needed to believe in. From that day until this, I have never failed to pray in the morning, on my knees, asking for help, and at night to express my gratitude for my life, and most of all, for my sobriety. I choose to kneel because I feel I need, you can put that on now, I need to humble myself when I pray, and with my ego, this is the most I can do. 
If you're asking why I do all of this, I will tell you, because it works. It's as simple as that. I would say the world became strangely now, good. I'd like to bring on someone that I've been dying to play with for the last 25 years. Turn it up louder, please. <laughs> and it's finally come to pass. So please welcome Steve Winwood. If you like that, you got to go home and watch it later because they get into a jam section there. It's not long, and they end it vocally very good. Who enjoyed that? Oh, yeah, okay, there you go. All right, good. I'm going to give you three points, three things to remember on what you can expect, what you can look for, what you can believe for as you become one who learns how to live in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to give you something that you can, three things that you can just think about. I'm going to show you how, how David the psalmist uh, uh, gives these to us. And I, I just saw these yesterday. Really, I, I don't know where I'm going until I just get in the Word and just sit and listen for God. Honey, really, that's when you think I'm doing nothing, that's really some of what I'm doing. <laughs> that can help things become strangely dim in your lives. Who needs some things to become strangely dim in their lives? Let's find that place, that presence of the Lord to live. To finally say, I have finally found the place to live. Not to visit. Not to live. To abide in the presence of the Lord. And maybe that's somewhat of why the Lord's leading us for communion. Because you know what? I want the presence of the Lord in a way like we've never seen or experienced. We need it. 
The first one is, is, is uh, the, your, your first point, three of them, very simple, is direction. Living in the presence of the Lord avails to us direction. Guys, Victor, Peter, Danny, stay in the presence of the Lord. When you go to Sarnia, don't go to Windsor and go to that casino. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> in the pre it gives us direction. It says that scripture from verse 11 says, uh, Psalm 16, verse 11, um, James, you will show me the path of life. He will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Isaiah 30 verse 21 says, it says, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or wherever you whenever you turn to the left. When, we're, when we've got the presence of the Lord, he's not going to stay silent. He's going to show us the path of life. He's going to tell you that you can include him in every decision. I'm sure Danny and Lily did some serious praying this week in selling their house and buying a house. And I don't think it's any coincidence, I'm just going to echo my prayer for, these, the, uh, for our three easy riders up here. He'll speak to you. He'll tell you which way to take. You guys got to be in tune. He'll tell you which way not to take. You hear that voice, it says in Isaiah. He'll say, go this way, go that way. Isn't it great to serve a God that you can expect that from? Yes. And you can live in that? Joyce Meyer tweeted this week. I don't think Joyce Meyer tweeted it. I think she has somebody tweets for her. Some of our greatest problems have the simplest answers if we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's a road of joy. You know, I, uh, most of you know the pop of prayer that, I've, uh, that the Lord, I believe, has created for me to pray for my grandchildren. And what I've done is I've taken this prayer and for their second birthdays, I've both given them a plaque. I've got one for Nevaeh, for Lincoln. There's Lincoln's Papa's prayer. I think he has that in his room. And then I've got one for Nevaeh. She's got one in her room. Well, both beach. I don't know if we planned it that way, the pictures. Yes. But one of the prayers I have on there is, Lord, may their roads be joyful roads. <laughs> I pray that for them almost every day. May their road, who wants a joyful road? Who knows, we've got to choose joy sometimes. And make a decision to rejoice. May their roads be joyful roads. I will show you the path of life. Show me, Lord, the path of life because in your presence is fullness of joy. That's another thing in choosing joy, Linda. We hear God a little bit more clearly. Because when we don't choose the joy and we just live in regret or we live in, in, in a mopey attitude, and we just, are we really taking advantage of, and I say that carefully, taking advantage of, are we really taking the benefits of the presence of God? Because in his presence, there's fullness of joy. So direction. That was simple, wasn't it? Number two. If you look in Psalm 17, these are all fairly close together. Psalm 17, verses 2 to 9, it says, Let my vindication come from your presence. This is David, under assault, as most of his psalms find him under assault. Let my vindication come from your presence. Let your eyes look on the things that are upright. You have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me and have found nothing. So there you go, folks. I don't care what you say from the new covenant here or there. God tests us. Nobody can convince me any differently. God tests. And there's New Testament scripts. Why someone would ever say that God does not test us is you just, we're just looking for an easy way out. God does test our hearts because he's given us a free will. But, you know, we discussed this last year, I believe. Or, uh, when God, when you, who knows that when you go into a test, Whoever's giving the tests, he knows you're ready. You know, when I used to teach swimming, I remember once I had this, this prominent family or kind of whatever, this family in Niagara on the Lake, and, and uh, I already knew that this, well, anyway, there's a history of this man, but I taught both of his kids swimming, and um, I was just a teenager. I was 17, 18 years old, and as one of his boys, I just didn't think he was ready for the test, so I didn't put him in it. Whoa, I've never, this is a dot on my on my connect the dot kind of life because I got a phone call from him. Do you remember this mom? You remember who I'm talking about? And uh, he, he called, he came to the pool, whatever he did, and he basically told me what he thought about my swimming instruction. He called me a name that started with, with A and ended in E. There's two S's in there. There's an H and the, anyway, whatever. 
He did. A grown man. I'm a teenager. I didn't put his kid in the test. You know, maybe I should have put him in. But the reason I didn't put him in the test, because we were taught to do that. It was her fault. <laughs> You're taught to do that. Why put somebody in the test if they're going to fail? Right? When you have a test in school, don't, don't you have reviews? The teachers work with you. I hope they still do that. If the Lord's going to test you, Rachel, he knows you're ready for the test. And if you're being tested, you find yourself out there and you're being pulled the world in the presence of God, that means, that means you're in school. That means God's testing you. That means you're ready. And what happens when you get tested? What do you do? You move on. You go to the next level. You know how, how many of us just forsake the next level? Because we don't want to take the test. We're afraid of the test. We doubt ourselves. The presence of the, God will, the, 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 presence of the Lord does test us. So here he says, you have tested my heart, you have visited me in the night, you have tried me and found nothing. I have purposed that my mouth shall not transgress concerning the works of men by the word of your lips. I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer, uphold my steps in your paths that my footsteps may not slip. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Where's your glass of water? <coughs> I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Show me your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand. I go back to verse 2. Let my vindication come from your presence. Let your eyes look on the things that are upright. Basically, this is what it is. Is that number one was direction. Number two is protection. And if you read, I read all of those verses just so you can go by and look at them again. But what's he talking about? Lord, guard the words of my mouth. You're my vindication. When somebody comes up against me, when my enemy comes against me, or I've got things, whatever they are, seen or unseen, physical or spiritual, what did he say? The Lord, he, he said, Lord, I watched the words of my mouth. I watched what I said. Bingo, to last week. I watched what I said. I will take advantage of, I will live in the presence of the Lord, and I will speak what the presence of the Lord tells me to speak, and not speak what I sometimes want to speak. Let me just repeat this one more time, please. You have tested. Uh, let my vindication come from your presence. Let your eyes look on the things that are upright. You have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me, and I have found nothing. I have purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. I have purposed. You know, it's not, thank you, Grant. It's not... Is that all right? I have purposed. I have purposed. It just doesn't, it's not kind of this twilight thing, oh, we get this presence and everything's all just lovey-dovey and everything. No, I have purposed to stay in the presence of God and my mouth will not transgress. I will not speak anything but what the presence of God leads me to speak. This is where I was supposed to comment on Alexander's uh, uh, six months in Africa and his word last week. 3120. Psalm 3120. This is all from David. This echoes. He says, You shall hide them in this. Oh, let's go start at verse 19. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, who live in the presence of the Lord, I'll say. If you want my definition this morning for the fear of God, those who live in the presence of God, which you have prepared for those who trust you in the presence of the sons of men. You shall hide them, meaning us, in the secret place of your presence from the plots of men. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of, from the strife of tongues. tongues. Hello. I've seen this in industry. I've seen this in the business. And maybe this is why God's kept me in there for so long. Because I've seen it work. And I've had the opportunity to influence other people. Ungodly people. Not walking believers. And I've shown them the benefits of holding your tongue. The benefits of choosing your words carefully. And not speaking everything you think. And I'm still, I'm still learning it. The presence of God is protection. He needs your words to cooperate. Amen? Basically, that's it. That's number two. We're moving along. Oh, no. Romans 13, 12. This fits so perfectly. Did I give it to you? Hopefully, I put it in there. Then 
Is that it? Uh, yes. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I love that scripture. Just imagine, you can walk with an armor of light that needs to be put on. And if I can just connect these dots for this message this morning, and I'll tell you it's scriptural, it's theologically sound, is that when we want the armor of light and to walk in that armor of light, you want your children to walk in the armor of light, even when you're not in their presence. Speak the truth. Speak God's word. Speak the presence of God. It's just as much about what you don't say than what you do say. So, it's direction and it's protection. And the last one, verse 3, go back to Psalm 21, please. Psalm 21. The last one kind of echoes Psalm 16 is, uh, is joy. Now, we saw that in Psalm 16. You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. But verse 11 of Psalm 16, I want to use its direction. Its direction. Okay? I pray for my grandchildren. Lord, may the road be a joyful road. I pray, that for, I pray that for you. I pray that for almost anybody I pray for. Our roads be joyful roads. There's power in joy. Do you know? Do you know? That if you take these words for presence in the Hebrew that I've shared with you from all these Psalms thus far. And if you look into the concordance, you look into the Hebrew concordance, do you care to guess what the one word definition of presence is in the Hebrew? It's face. Being in the presence of God, it, you know, I can't complicate this. It's just so, it was just so there. It's being in the face of God. Being in the face of God. Because our face tells everything. Does it not? We say, oh, that person wears their emotions on their sleeve. Don't ever take offense to that. Because if you don't wear your emotions on your sleeve, if you can hide with your face what you're feeling inside, that's not a good place to be. Here it says in Psalm 21, verse 7, it says, The king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord. David's praying about himself. This is his own confession. And in your salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. I think I maybe wanted to read a couple more. Um... Uh, you know what? I don't know what the time is. We're close. But the king, let's start at verse 1. The king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, and in your salvation. How greatly shall he rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with the blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold upon his head. He asked life from you and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great in your salvation. Honor and majesty you have placed upon him and you have made him most blessed forever. You have made him exceedingly glad with your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord and through the mercy of the Most High he shall not be moved. We trust in the presence of the Lord. I wrote something here. I got a lot of notes here, but I won't go to all of them. But it says, um, when we learn, this is what I wrote, when we learn to trust the presence of the Lord, joy follows. When we learn to trust in the presence of the Lord. Not just joy. Think of the 23rd Psalm, where it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. But surely, goodness is and mercy shall follow me all the days of the Lord. It says, in the presence of his enemies, David said. He had enemies everywhere. Whether you recognize, I don't, regardless of how well life is going, how good life is right now, you have any, the world is your enemy. We lose sight of that. You know what it says, scripture, the apostle, Paul, the apostle John says it so clearly. To love the world means we don't love Jesus. And there's that continual conflict, that pulling of, of, of uh, allegiance seems, seems so impersonal. It's like, we have enemies. The world is our enemy. That doesn't mean we all hole up here and we build a good fa big fence and say, no, oh, it's to keep them away. No, we're in the world. 
We're not of the world. We are to have an influence on the world. We carry the presence of God into the world. That's what we're called to do. I touched on this when we first started discussing it back in the summer. I used uh, Lincoln Appliance as an example. That if uh, Peter, who's a believer, and he walks into somebody's house, he's never been there before, he walks in to work on their appliance, Peter doesn't carry a tool kit. He doesn't cool, uh, carry the title of Lincoln Appliance or all the skills he has first. He carries the presence of God. When Aaron goes on a fire call, he carries the presence of God. When you go into the bank, you carry the presence of God. When you go to a restaurant today, you carry the presence of God. When you go home today, where life is really real, you carry the presence of God. Of God. Put Psalm 23 up there again for me, please, uh, James. Did I have Psalm 23 on my PowerPoint? No? Okay. In the presence of my enemies, basically, I have this in the presence of my enemies, the presence of God rules. That's the intent. I think I made myself clear on that. We carry the presence of God. We bring the presence of God. We carry the face of the Lord. Oh, I had something written here and it was so good and I can't find it, but that's all right. The presence of the Lord challenges us. The presence of the Lord is a good place to be. It's a great place to be, to live in the presence of the Lord. But it just doesn't happen. It's just not something there. It doesn't just wake up with your alarm clock. We have to activate it. He, we have to activate it to get the full scope, to get the full realization, expectation, and experience of the presence of the Lord. God will not move. James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And I, I'd like to think Yes, yes, he draws nearest to us, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's a far way off. I like how C.S. Lewis says it in one of the Narnia Chronicles when it was either Lucy or Susan who got close to Aslan, and they said, Aslan, you are so much, oh my goodness, you're so much bigger. And Aslan looked at Lucy, and he says, no, 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 darling, I don't know if he said darling. No, not really. He goes, you're just a little closer. You're a little closer. Staying close to the presence of God. And it's a challenge. It is definitely a challenge, but we believe, God, that he deserves to be worshipped. He desires to be worshipped. Regardless of what's going on in your life or what's not going on in your life, worshipping God is the ultimate. That's the first. That's the above all. But here we can see that when we go in the presence of God and David, learning from the one who was after God's own heart, knowing the one who had disappointed God, who had failed God and failed people, but he was still called and written in the annals of time, the man after God's own heart, he saw that there was direction. He experienced the direction from being in the presence of the Lord. He saw there was protection to be found. He experienced protection in the presence of the Lord, and he had joy. Joy carried him. Joy took him. Joy sustained him, and joy changed the people that were around him in the presence of the Lord. He had to fight for it. It's kind of, let's stand, it's, it, it's, it's kind of something like this. I, you know, I, I, um, all, all summer, I've been riding my bike a lot into Niagara on the Lake, or, or even even uh, have uh, ventured out to run a bit, or to walk in Niagara on the Lake. And as I'm going down Highway 55 or whatever, I, one day I was driving down there. I was riding my bike, and all of a sudden, normally I'm passing people. All of a sudden, this young girl passes me on the bicycle, and she's going at a good rate of speed. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, either she's going very fast or I'm going very slow. And so I started to pick up my speed, and I allowed her to pace me. Oh my goodness. I'm telling you, I was not going fast at all. I realized when I'm by myself, when I'm just by myself, I'm not really getting the workout that's available. So then what I started to do, I started to play this little game. And as I was riding my bike into town, I would find a measuring mark. I'd find a telephone pole. And if there was a car coming the other way or I could hear a car behind me, I would get to that telephone pole before that car got there. And it was really, it's uncanny. I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a gift I have, but it was really cool that I would choose a car or a telephone pole you could just see and measure it, that it was going to be a challenge. 
And that was my challenge all the time. And I'm always, but in order for me to be challenged, in order for me to be drawn, in order for me to better myself, I have to have that challenge. I have to have that pace. I have to have that pace setter. I have to have that presence of someone else or something else. And that's the way we live our life. And that's who God is. And that's who his presence is. He draws us. He challenges us. He says, no, no, you can come up higher. You need to come up higher. A, because I'm worthy. Say A. A. He's worthy. Okay, so there's four points. He's worthy. B, you need direction. Say, I need direction. direction. C, number three, say, I need protection. protection. And four, I need joy. joy. Come on, say it with a smile. I need joy. joy. And in his prayer, who, and if you recognize you need that joy and you have difficulty with joy, and joy too often is just becoming a choice. (laughs) I want want less of it just being a choice. I want it to happen. Live in the presence of the Lord. Welcome the presence of the Lord. Here's the quote I was looking for. It was my quote. Of, I wrote it. We need, we, we need what God draws us to is that place of trusting the presence of the Lord, not fearing the presence of the Lord. Wanting that presence, the presence of the Lord, not regretting the presence of the Lord. Regret? Do you fight to get into church? People aren't at church today because they regret the presence of the Lord. Young or old. Thank you, Jesus. Did this make sense? Did it? And I believe as we come here on Sundays, and I wasn't intending on saying this because I want to see with new eyes every day. I believe that this is ushering. I believe this is availing. Another step towards the presence of God in a manner we've not yet to experience. Not just corporately, but individually. Jesus. Put up your hands. Thank you, Father. After the service, come on forward. I'll pray for you. By all means. Hallelujah. Pray this with me. Lord, you've blessed me. You've kept me. You've caused your face to shine upon me. You've been gracious to me. Lord, lift up your countenance upon me. And give me your peace. Cause me to hear your loving kindness every day at the beginning. Lord, I trust in you. Cause me to know the way I'm to walk. I lift up my soul to you. Show me your ways. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach me. You, presence of God, are my salvation. On you, I hope. And I wait all the day. (laughs) Teach me your ways. I will walk in your truth. I will walk in your presence. Unite my heart to fear your name. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. For you will not leave my soul in shoal, nor will you allow me, your Holy One, because of Jesus and through Jesus, to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. My spirit, Rick Mills, Say your name. It magnifies the Lord. And my soul rejoices. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. I declare you have done great things for me. And holy is your name. Mercy. Mercy upon me, upon mine, and generations. Jesus. Amen. Amen. God richly bless you. Walk in the presence of the Lord.